If you can imagine with me, and I don't think it would be hard to do, uh, a renowned scientist who is a professor at a great university but doesn't really love his students, kind of gets annoyed by them. <laughs> or perhaps there is some esteemed lawyer who um, loves being a lawyer but hates dealing with young men who get in trouble. Or perhaps there's some famous doctor who can p barely tolerate being around sick people. And you'd ask yourself, well, why would anyone pursue those professions if they don't really love those that they're called to serve? Or perhaps it could be because of the titles, the money, the, all the perks that go along with it. You know, when I was at UCLA, professors loved to do research, hated being in the classroom. Doctors who love to walk around being called doctor this and doctor that, but really the bedside manner is horrible. Um, or, or perhaps you just interact with people like that, and I think you know where I'm going with this. Because it's possible for men to love studying, love the academic side of Christianity. They can even love ministry. But people, that's the issue. <laughs> just don't like people. Sometimes the saints can really be an annoyance to them. And, and, and I was preaching a few years ago, going through the book of Revelation. And when I, when I came across Revelation chapter 2, um, I mean, I just had this horrible kind of fear that in our Bible churches, it happens far too often that we can love studying our week but not love the sheep. We can love our times of just being enraptured by just looking at the Word of God, but then lose our love for God. And what I want to use this time I have uh, with you all today is just to encourage you to love the sheep. You, you have to love the sheep to be a pastor. You have to. Um, I mean, and when you look at what God has called us to do, and there's all kinds of challenges and struggles and things that you're going to have to deal with. And, all, and you've been, you'll be trained very well to think through a lot of the problems that you have to deal with biblically and opening up the text and do those types of things. But it won't mean a whole lot how you minister if you don't love the sheep. So what I want to do, I want you to turn with me to First Thessalonians, I mean, First Corinthians chapter 13. And I just want to look at just some challenges, some obstacles, three particular in this passage, I, I think, and I'm going to do this in application sense, that you have to overcome to be an effective pastor and overcome by walking and serving and ministering in the more excellent way, the way of love. You know the church of Corinth, all the challenges, the infighting, the, the sin that they had. And Paul, at the end of chapter 12, has this little phrase, I will show you still a more excellent way. And he's going to lay out just a real clear description of love. And I've lumped them into three different categories. I'm going to apply them as we have to look at our calling and our challenges in ministry and how to be effective at that by overcoming these challenges by walking in love. In verse 4, Paul says of chapter 13, Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into an account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Um, to be a, a pastor who is loving his sheep, you know, the first challenge or obstacle you have to overcome is you. Um, you just have to choose the way of love, the more excellent way of love. When it just comes to dealing with your own sins, your own weaknesses, your own struggles and dealing with people. And here this description of love, I think, is very helpful telling us how to do that. It simply says love is patient, first of all. Love is patient. And here it's talking about being patient with not just circumstances, but patient with people. Having the capacity to be wrong and not retaliate. Uh, having the capacity of restraining your anger Having the capacity of not being vengeful or someone who, you know, retaliates easily, but having the capacity just to be patient with people. There's a quote by one of our church fathers, and it says, It is the word which is used of, a, of the man who is wronged and who has it easily in his power to avenge himself, but will never do it. That's the word here, man. It's just the spirit of just being patient. In Proverbs chapter 16, 
verse 32, the word of God says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. And it's looking at a person who can be patient and likens them to soldiers or or just mighty great men. And that's what it, that, that the man who's being patient is that kind of a leader. It's like if the man who can be patient is like stronger than an NFL player or, 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 or has, in a sense, more toughness than someone who's a Green Beret. The text here calls us to be those who are patient with people. Now, I almost want to ask how many of you men are married and have kids. Uh, um, if, if you're not married and God's calling you to the ministry, uh, just one great place to learn how to be patient is to get married and have kids. Um, I've got six kids, like Brother Toussaint said, and uh, I thought I was a godly guy. You know, I graduated from the Master Seminary. I mean, what more can you ask for from a brother? So here it is, you know. <laughs> but I was single when I left seminary. I was single, I was pastoring at 29, I was single, and then I got married, and I found out maybe I wasn't as godly as I thought. Required patience, to, patience not because my wife wasn't, but just because, because what was inside of me. And then we started having kids, one kid, and I was okay, you know, you know, you know, call grandma, pawn off on the one kid and go out on date nights with my wife. Then we had two kids and three kids and four kids. Next thing I know, I mean, I, I can't I get in time with my wife, you know, trying to get away. Then five kids and six kids. And then I'm just sitting in the house. I'm walking around all the time like, hey, hey this is my time with my wife. She's my wife, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and God begins to use this, these circumstances to show that, Bobby, you know, you needed to grow in some patience. Uh, you know, in order to be an effective pastor, we need to love the saints. And to love them, we need to be patient. Also, the text says love is kind. Love is kind. It's, it's the act of um, goodness, or goodness in action, you could say. Um, it reflects how God is. When it says the kindness of God is what leads us uh, to repentance. That we need to be kind. And when we are ministering, there's all kinds of pressure that you're under. We live in a world where we have all kinds of time commitments and it's a stressful thing. We're dealing with people who are, you know, have real problems. And here it is, all this pressure's on us. And we can walk around with scowls on our face all the time or be short with people, be irritated by people. But here, the more excellent way is the way of love. And the way of love is the way of kindness. There's a story told of President Jefferson that he was riding horseback across the country. Let me read this to you. It says that uh, he was traveling with a group of other men and they were crossing a river. And it says that once on the other side, they picked up a guy, President Jefferson picked up a guy and carried him across the river. It says once on the other side, one of the group asked the man, he said, why did you pick the president to ask him to carry you over the river? And he said that I didn't know he was the president. All I know is that on some of their faces, I kept saying no. But when I looked at his face, I saw yes. And our saints, they, they, they have needs and, and they, they want to be ministered to. They want their pastor to minister to them, but they can look at us and, and not sense an approachability, not sense a kindness in their heart, a willingness to actually do good to them. Here is where their passion, they're afraid to come and call us, afraid to come because he's the pastor after all. He's, he's busy and he has to do that and he has to do the other things. And, and, and look at him. He, he, he looks like he just has too much on him. But here the Bible says the more excellent way is a way of love. And the way of love is being patient. The way of love is being kind. And then the text says not only that, it says love is kind and is not jealous. That love is not jealous. The idea of not being envious of others, uh, easily, you know, dissatisfied or discontent. You know, you know be, being content with who you are, who God made you to be, and not be upset that every single year they invite Steve Lawson to come preach at the Shepherds Conference, and they don't invite me. <laughs> now everybody know I can preach. <laughs> Alice Montoya said in my lab that I can preach, but they call it everybody else but me. And I said that in a joking way. But you'll be in a ministry with other people whom God has gifted, not just you. Other brothers who can preach. Tucson can preach. I don't know why I'm up here, but Tucson can preach. But other guys who can preach and other guys who can teach and, and, and other people will start to say things about them and, and they'll go to their Bible studies and, and maybe me, there may be something inside of you called sin 
The mayor is rising and wringing his ugly head, and you'll have to put it to death. And it's called jealousy. Being jealous of other people in your ministry. And you'll just have to deal with that. You know, when we went through a merger a year ago, almost to the date, you know, we had our first worship service together. And uh, we, our, our church merged with the Westside Bible Church. And some of you know Pastor Anthony Kidd. He'll be here. And so now you have, you know, a couple preaching pastors and people love to compare. I'm of, you know, they just love to compare. I'm of Paul. I'm of this. I'm that. You know. Now, Pastor Kidd is, is tall, six foot three, handsome guy, kind of suave, <laughs> uh, real gregarious and just smooth in general. I'm short, uh, kind of invert, not smooth, kind of rough. You know, that's kind of how I am. And people don't mind pointing that out. <laughs> Well, Bobby, Pastor Kid is. You print to pass the kid's name again to me. And <laughs> so, but so what do you do? We have to respond in love. And it's not jealous. That's, that's, that's not love, man. Uh, love isn't jealous. And what you want in your church, especially if you're going to, if, if you want God to use you in a profound way, you need to be humble and be content to have gifted men around you. You need to learn how to be one amongst many and not to be the guy in the spotlight, the guy who everyone talks about. You just got to kill jealousy. You just can't be. That's not love, man. And then fourthly, it says that love does not brag. Love does not brag. It doesn't parade itself. It's not about me. Uh, it's about Christ. It's not bragging. Uh, that's not love. It's not looking for the applause of others. That's not love. But the Corinthians, they were just, they, they wanted the showy gifts. They wanted it to be about them. I have the gift of tongues. I have the gift of prophecy. I have the gift of knowledge. And they, they wanted all those things. They wanted the showy gifts. They wanted to be in a spotlight. They wanted to be that. And so Paul is confronting them. That's, that's not a place. In the, there's not a place for that in the church. That love does not brag, he says. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. That they had to humble themselves and walk in unity and not about me. And then this next characteristic of love is almost similar. It says love is not arrogant or puffed up, doesn't have an over exaggerated opinion of oneself. That's not love. Not pompous, not looking for self adoration. Um, it just it deflects its giftedness, or I should say, reflects uh, just just others, and it's not focused on me. There's a story told about Muhammad Ali. You know, Muhammad Ali was the greatest boxer ever. He didn't mind telling everybody that that he was the greatest. Uh, when he beat Sonny Liston, he just run around the ring, and all the reporters had pre predicted that he would lose. And I, you know, he was, I fooled you. I fooled you, and I fooled you. I'm the, I'm the greatest in the world. And he was shouting, I'm the greatest in the world. He believed that about himself. He was on a plane flying, and a stewardess came by and, and said, Mr. Ali, I'm sorry, but I have to remind you that you have to buckle up. And he, he looked at her and told her, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And, and the stewardess responded back, well, Mr. Ali, and Superman doesn't need a plane either. <laughs> that... That, and we not only need a plane, we need sea bus, we need all kinds of people around us. That, that, that we need all the saints laboring alongside of us. And it's not about you. You know, sometimes we, we think, well, the church is doing so well because I'm here now. Uh, that's not why the church does well. That's not why. If your church is doing well, it's because Jesus promised to build the church. It's him. It's his glory. It's not you. You know, we can go into churches with all puffed up and and, and, and people will tolerate it to a degree. But God won't. <laughs> he doesn't like sharing his glory. And if you want to be used mildly of God, want to be a blessing to the people of God, then you have to walk humbly and not be arrogant, not be puffed up. And just our flesh will tempt us to do these things, man. And then sixthly, it says love does not act unbecomingly. Love doesn't act unbecomingly. The idea of sh shamefully, disgracefully, rude, that's not love. Inappropriately, ill-mannered, rudely, that's not love. Um, I think it was a few years ago, I was at the Moody Pastors Bible Conference, and I was doing a workshop there, and Dr. MacArthur was one of the plenary speakers. 
And that evening, he, I think for about an hour, I'm not going to mention any names. I would in my church, but I'm not going to mention any names. He was just in the attack mode. And everybody knew exactly who he was talking about. He was, he was describing how when we stand in the pulpit, that is the most holy place. You're opening up the word of God. You're speaking the word of God to the people of God, to be blessed by God. And how is it possible that you could profane that with vile, utter, gutter language speech? And everybody knew who he was talking about. You know who I'm talking about, perhaps, as well. And for an hour, he was just in attack mode, just going, because there was a large group of this conference that were getting pulled and falling. I'm of him and I'm of that. And they were loving the fact that some guys within conservative evangelicalism was pulling the church into the gutter with their filthiness and how they even exposit books like the Song of Solomon and just say crash things and, and young people were being enamored by them and for an hour he was going on and on and on just hammering this and I sat here I was beside Victor Scholl another team of alumni I said when God takes him to glory who is going to do that in the church God will raise someone up I mean there is no place for that in the church there's no place for rudeness vulgarity and vileness That we need to be men who are discreet and honorable and honor the word of God. Men who are sober minded and respectable. But our church today, we just get pulled all over the place. Um, Men can be gifted and charismatic and we follow them because they're gifted and charismatic. And ignore the fact that love does not act unbecomingly. You know, my community where I serve, sometimes it just happens so often that Guys do scandalous things, openly scandalous things. And, you know, the church just follows after them and say that that's forgiving, that's loving, that's kindness. And they call that love just to overlook just outrageous, shameful behavior by men who call themselves preachers of the word of God. But for us, men, uh, we just have to we have to make sure that our our actions are loving. And then it says love does not seek its own, not self-serving. Right. It's not self-serving, not narcissistic pursuits. Uh, We're not doing ministry for our sake, writing books for our sakes, wanting to get our name out in the circus so we're preaching so we become rich and famous and well-known celebrity pastors. We have a celebrity pastor cult today where, but, but we think that success equals, like in the American sense, success equals big, large, all that. The, The New Testament churches were house churches. They didn't have houses even the size of our houses. They were small congregations. And you're not a failure, man, if you leave here and your church is just 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 people. You're not a failure. But somehow we think that we need to, our name has to get out there. And love's not like, that's not self-serving. It's not seeking its own. That's not what love is. Um, I'm mindful of him because of the season we're in. That Martin Luther King preached a sermon about the Good Samaritan years ago. And when he, he, he described or contrasted the Samaritan with the Levite and, and the priest, and, and he asked a profound question. He, he wanted his listeners to think through, why is it that when the priest and the Levite saw the man robbed, bleeding, and in danger of losing his life, when they saw him, why is it that they saw him and crossed the street and went to the other side? And Martin Luther King said that because they they asked the wrong question, the question that they asked when they saw the man lying, bloodied, dying, the question that they asked is, what will happen to me if I stop to help this man? After all, he got robbed. Maybe the robbers are still around the corner. I, I might be late to my appointment. What will happen to me? And when the good Samaritan came, he asked the opposite question. What will happen to this man if I don't stop? If I don't help him? Brothers, if we're going to be shepherds of God's flock, it can't be about us. It can't be about seeking our own. We have to ask the question, what will happen if I don't call Mrs. Jones? Yet she hasn't been to church in three, four weeks. She doesn't give a whole lot anyway, so who cares? Well, God cares. You ought to care. Can't be about us, brothers. That's not love. Love is an action word. Love is a sacrificial word. Love is a word that describes us dying to ourselves for the people that Christ died for and see that as our highest privilege. Just to love. Just to love the sheep. And if we're going to be pastors, 
who just don't love exegesis and love our theology and love we, we, to, 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 to love God's people, then these are attributes and descriptions, man, we're going to have to put on and put to death the flesh, our flesh and our tendencies not to be these things. You know, just think about the opposite of what the text would say if we don't put to death these things. Love is impatient. Love is unkind. Love is jealous. Love does brag. Love is arrogant. It is. It does act unbecomingly. It's always seeks its own. It's, it's easily provoking. Just go on and on and on. Uh, and there are churches with pastors like that. And at times we have these characteristics. And if we're going to be faithful pastors, we need to put on love. That's the more excellent way. And putting on love with these descriptions means we, get, we need to put to death our, our tendency to walk in the flesh and manifest impatience and all those other things we're so easily tempted to do. You know, this the second area of struggle. And, and, and here I'm just putting this outline together by way of application. Not only do we need to deal with just the challenges in our own self to put on love and, the, and serve in the more excellent way, but also just in responding to others, just, just the sins of others. We have to put on love so that we're being faithful pastors. When it says in verse five that uh, love is not provoked, here is talking about the fact that when someone's actions can potentially arouse anger in us, that we just don't go there. We just don't go there. Uh, There's a quote by Benjamin Franklin said, whatever is begun in anger ends in shame that we can really be tempted to respond. And, 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 and I can just. If, I don't know how many of you have been or pastoring now or you've been in the ministry for any length of time, but it, it's a battlefield. And the people that you're actually trying to help most can be kind of some of your worst enemies and critics. Uh, I, you know, after church, you all, you all know what everybody eats after church? Go home. They roast, roasted, pot, roasted pastor. That's everybody's favorite meal. Well, that sermon, that, that sermon, what, you know, and you guys think you're bad in chat when you critique every speaker. When you go to church, everybody's going to critique everything you say. Half the congregation will love that sermon. The next half will hate it. It's roasted pastor every week, and, and, and you'll have a tendency to want to be easily provoked, and you can't. People will talk about you. They'll talk about your clothes. They'll talk about your kids. They'll talk about your wife. And you just can't respond tit for tat. You just can't be easily provoked. Love is the better way. Love is the greater way. Um, you know, there's a, there's a tragedy happened some years ago. Um, there's a father whose son was at uh, Texas A&M University, and um, he was a cadet in the Marine. In, in the in the uh, he was a cadet in uh, the. I, I'm losing my word here. Um, um, he was a cadet there, studying to be a soldier, and and, uh, and partly what they had him do just to he had kind of not follow some protocol and so they just had him just exercise and work out until he dropped and he died and the father could have sued like the Corinthians sued everybody but he just wrote a real loving compassionate letter and said that he didn't blame you all that his son knew the Lord and his son was in glory that there are times when you really will be tempted men to defend yourself don't go there let God defend you if you need to be defended. Let God vindicate you if you need to be vindicated. If people say things about you, right, and they'll be ugly and bad, you know what you can tell yourself? Well, I'm glad they don't know all the rest of the stuff I do. <laughs> 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 you, you, they, uh, whatever they say about you, you're a sinner. Just, just, just wear that badge and just know that you're a sinner saved by grace. Uh, and don't be easily provoked. Love also does not take into an account a wrong suffered. It's not resentful. It's not unforgiving. Um, that's not what love is. Um, it doesn't take into it. It doesn't keep lists and things like that of uh, what someone did and didn't do for you. Um, you know, when you go out to pastor, that you're going to go to a church, and this might this is a new fl- newsflash. It might shock you. You're going to go to a church full of sinners, and they will sin against each other and they will sin against you sometimes and we just can't be the list keepers Christ when he forgave us he erased our list separate our sins as far as the east is from the west and bury them and that's how you need to be just a, a loving pastor love and action and when people sin against us we need to respond in just loving gracious kind ways um, and not keep lists 
Love does not take into an account a wrong suffered. Um, and also, as we're ministering in, with God's people and ministering into his church, not only do we not you know, keep lists like that, but also love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Um, that things will happen in the church and someone may struggle and fall and say, well, that, uh, she won't no good, no way, right? Or he wasn't no good, no way, and they just got what they deserved. And, that, and that, that, that there's a way of thinking that uh, as in pastors that when you're looking and shepherding the flock, that it's easy sometimes for us to become cynical. And the longer you minister, you can become cynical. And when bad things happen to people or something wrong happens to people, sometimes you can actually feel a little good about that. You know, when I went and uh, when I remember the first church I left, well, actually, I think it was about five years into my ministry, we did a merger. And uh, some of the saints didn't really, I think it was three people voted against the merger. And so we're there, we merged together, and I'm pastoring. And there was... Um, one lady who voted against the merger, and whenever I would stand up to preach, this is what she would do. She would stand up. She would wait till I would get in the pulpit. She would stand up and walk out and say, uh, I need to go somewhere where I can learn something, and just walk out the door. And everybody would see her. And you're like, <laughs> you just turn your head, and she was just, and she would stand out in front, just bad mouth me and bad mouth the church. Uh, and, uh, you know, things didn't really go well for her. I mean, she left the church, and things didn't go well for her. And, and I and I, and and I mean, that there's a part of you in your flesh could say, "Good," you know, but <laughs> but you just, you know, you just, you just don't, you know, you know, you don't want to do that, right? Uh, but love rejoices with the truth, hearing and learning and memorizing the truth. We just, uh, we need to rejoice in that. Um, and then the third thing, and I'm let me do this, and I'll be done. That. In ministry, as we're responding to just our own sin and the more excellent way is respond to love and other people, the more excellent ways to respond in love and hear these descriptions pretty much tell us how we need to respond in love. The third challenge is just overcoming. And here I'm just doing this by way of application, just overcoming just challenges in ministry with love. It's just the circumstances that God providentially, providentially will allow you to be. And we're in a fallen, broken world. And sometimes things will be hard. It says in verse seven. That love bears all things, right? Love bears all things. We've already talked about being patient with people, but you have to be able to bear up under difficult circumstances as a pastor. Um, one of the things, and I don't know why this is, and, you know, in our Bible churches, sometimes I think people think because you're a pastor or you're a Christian, a lot of times they just think that you don't have the same struggles that they'll have. You know, so they'll give you a salary that's half of what all the rest of the elder, elders would have. And the, I, I don't know how they think, you know, you'll survive, but they'll just, you know, and, and that'd be difficult. And there'd be a while where you may feel like I'm underappreciated, <laughs> I'm overworked, I'm underpaid, and, and just be, and it's just difficult. It, it'll just be hard. And, and here what the text says is love bears all things, right? You do what God wants you to do and let God deal with all the circumstances and everything else. Just bear up under difficult circumstances and trust God. Um, you know, John Wooden, I'm a UCLA Bruin, I, and John Wooden has this wonderful quote, things turn out best for people who make the best of the way things turn out. Um, that here you, you know, you've graduated from, from the master so you think God's going to send you off to some, you know, mega church. You know, you're you're going to be the next John MacArthur you know, 20,000 people and everybody's going to be lining up just to come and get your autograph and all this kind of stuff. You'll be an author and all this, you know, it just, but, 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 but it may end up where you go to a church, like I said, and there are just 40 people. What do you do? Is that okay? Just to love 40 people? Or you just, I'm going to stay here with these 40 people until a bigger church opens up with 80. Then I'm going to go to the 80 church. <laughs> well, now, and then one with 160, then I'm going to go to that church and go to that church and go to this church and go to that church. Or just bear under the circumstances that God providentially puts you in. Love bears all things. And love believes all things. Um, it, it's just not a gullibility here. Or, but it's not being suspicious of everyone. That everybody's out to get you and... Uh, you need rumors and gossip in the church and there'll be rumors and gossip in the church and and you just feel like everybody's out to get you but love believes all things and we need to hope all things the text says and so as we're putting on love and walking in the more excellent way that we can't 
you know, be walking around feeling like everybody's against us and we need to fight against everybody's me against them kind of a mentality. Just just believe all things and hope all things. Don't focus on past disappointments. Look to kind of the future good of what God is doing. Be patient. Wait on God in your ministries and trust that God is working in and through you as you faithfully love his people and love endures all things. Um, here we're just told that love suffers through persecution well, and you'll be persecuted. Things will go difficult. You'll have hard things to deal with in your ministry. Um, this and and you know I just think through just where just some of the challenges that I've had in ministry, and I wish I could just sit down and just kind of lay out all these things. Man, some of them are really hard. Um, you know, I've had just men very close to me just betray me and uh, leave the ministry and. Uh, um, I've had in other different circumstances um, where, um, you know, I, and it's not the why me thing. Like, you know, my house burned down. Like, remember, you get some of y'all know my house. I lost my house like a year or so ago. And uh, you're trying to be a faithful pastor. Like, God, how am I going to do this now? I don't have a house. I got six kids and I'm homeless, you know. <laughs> um, but you just have to endure through all those things. Um, and, and you have to be, I mean, here it is. Your house burns down and this, that, and the other. And. And it, it is just life will just get really hard sometimes. It will just get really, really, really hard sometimes. And here the text says that love endures all things. And then finally, the text tells us in verse eight, love never fails. True love never fails. It just survives. It just endures. It just works. And that's just true of all. And that's just as truism. These are these are written like just these axiomatic. These things are true of love. And God wants us to put on love just to over just to deal with our own sin, the sins of others and just to handle the circumstance. He providentially, providentially puts us in. Love is just a more excellent way. It's just a better way to be a faithful shepherd. We just have to walk. Brothers, we have to walk in love. You know, I opened up by asking you all this question. Like, I mean, how is it that. You know, someone could be a doctor and not love patients or a lawyer and not not care for people who get in trouble or be a, a teacher and have your students annoy you. That that when I look back over my life and I, I've had like great teachers and doctors and people because they love people. They that was the impact they had on, on me um, about Eight years ago, my daughter was diagnosed with a really rare form of cancer. We didn't know what was happening to her. The first time I took her to the hospital, it was 2 a.m. in the morning. And I carried her to the hospital, and here I am. And the doctor could see just how afraid I was. And he looked at me in the face, and he said this. He said, I'm going to treat her as if she is my very own daughter. I'm going to find out what is going on with your daughter. That just comforted my soul. God just encouraged me and helped me because this doctor showed love and care to a father who was afraid that his daughter was dying. And I have a cousin who was a lawyer and he, you know, when he was growing up, he was always in trouble. I mean, he would do horrific things, He'd steal his dad's car and drive out of the state. They would just do whole, all kinds of things. They would be driving down the street, just smash they would, with a baseball bat, he would drive down the street, smashing people's car windows. And it was just for fun. And when he became an adult, he's just a brilliant guy. He became a defense lawyer because he just thought about all the kids in the city who get in trouble, who get thrown underneath the prison, who never get another chance. He said, that could have been me. And so he's an amazing defense lawyer, never lost a case. Just a brilliant, just because he wants to help people. And then you think, how about... You know, I just think of our teachers. When I, I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, an inner city, a uh, really hard area when I was a kid. It was called the neediest city in the, in the country when I was there in the, in the, in the 60s or uh, in the second grade. And I flunked phonics. When you flunked phonics in the second grade, you know, that was kind of it. So I just struggled reading the rest of my life and hated school. And, uh, and I was one of those kids where, you know, if you just don't keep up, you got 40, 50 kids and you can't get personal attention. So I just struggled all the way through. And then when I became a Christian and started coming to grace, I would just be embarrassed trying to sound out words. And I had a, 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 there was a man at UCLA and it wasn't John MacArthur. Was, he just came alongside of me and, and helped me to read. He said, Bobby, this is a noun. This is oh, that's a noun. What's a down. This is a verb. And he, and he, and he started working with me. We met every single week and he taught me grammar and taught me and, and he just helped me because he just saw this little, he saw this guy that needed help and he just showed, he taught me how to read as an adult basically. 
the brothers. God has given us the highest privilege possible to be under shepherds, not by compulsion, not like the Pharisees, because I need a name or a title or be esteemed and respected, not for, not for money's sake, but he's called you just to reflect the glory, his glory to other people and the love that he has showered you with. He's called you to shower other people with that same love, to be like Christ, to imitate Christ. Is that your theme this year? Brothers, to imitate Christ, we have to walk in love. It's the more excellent way. And to learn how to love people, um, I mean, we need to be we need to be exposed to the text, but you've got to be able to love people. And I just encourage you in your next year, two years, three years, make sure you're in the church. Make sure that as you're growing to be a pastor, shepherd, it's not just in a love for his word so that we don't get pulled into being like the church in Ephesus, that you're loving people. And it's hard. It takes sacrifice. It won't be easy. But God will enable you to overcome all those challenges by walking in the more excellent way, the way of love. Let's bow together. Father, I thank you for this time that you've given us to be together today just to consider the simple truth that you first loved us so that we can love you and now we can love others. Oh God, help us to be a fountain of your love that you poured out on Calvary flowing through us to be a blessing to your people. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless you, man.